Okay, hey folks, Mark Locklear here. Today we're going to be talking about Chapter 5, uh, how to validate input data. Before we talk about that, let me make a few comments about the homework. Uh, generally, everything's looking pretty good. Uh, just a few comments I have. Number one is the uh, making sure you include all your files in your zip file. A few people submitted zip files, and uh, all of your .java files or folders for those files weren't there. So just you might want to double check after you create the zip file, uh, open it back up and make sure all the five files are there just just to make sure they're they're all there if, if they're not there then obviously you won't get credit for them uh, the other issue was comments inside a few people got dinged a, a couple of points for comments not having the author information or your name in the comments of the code and just one thing to be aware of there NetBeans by default will put uh, the author information in the code if it's a new Java program that you're creating but if you open an existing project like you do for the um, chapter exercises normally the chapter exercises will have you open up uh, and uh, uh, one of the example starts um, I think by default it does not put author information in so just make sure you do that I, I, mean, I don't want to be a stickler about it but it's just that's just one of those things that's important for every pro programmer to do is make sure you uh, have your author information and also as we move forward you know I would encourage you to comment put comments inside the code too for instance I'm looking at uh, this is our example start for chapter 5 uh, exercise 5.1. Notice how they've put comments inside here for kind of key parts of code. Really you should be doing that going forward is um, you know add put some comments in there and it certainly doesn't hurt to tell me what you're doing or what you're thinking and it, it also will help you out too. I mean if you if I make some comments on some code and you go back and look in it, it you know depending on how sophisticated it might be it's just it's it's good for you to be and I can tell you from an application development standpoint you know on a real for real uh, application comments are in invaluable because I may write an application and not it may be you know six months or a year before I go back and look at that code so it's very very helpful to have comments there to figure out what you were th thinking not only for you but if somebody else has to go behind you and look at your code um, it's, it's helpful to have those in okay so chapter five is how to validate input data so what are we talking about here so basically what we're talking about is you know checking the input that the user is putting into um, putting into your pro program so sort of when we think of a applications we're, we're dealing with kind of compiled Java code not with web applications but think about it from in terms of a website maybe that uh, a static website where there's no data in input where you've just kind of got a home page and an about page or a contact us page there's maybe not a lot of input data there but like true a applications that have logic involved and take input from data need to do uh, user input validation so for instance in our invoice application here so for instance uh, with the invoice app here um, we're asking for two pieces of information that the user is entering they're entering the customer type they're entering the sub total now We'll get more sophisticated as we move forward, but this invoice application is actually pretty um, it's pretty user friendly with regard to what the user can input. And for instance, if I go back, if I run this application, I'm asked to input the customer type. Now here, if I put in V, let's say, which is not a valid customer type, um, and I put in a subtotal. Well, it handles that pretty well, right? Now, it defaults to 10%. Of course, that's because our code ends with an else statement that says, well, if it's anything other than R and C, then you're going to automatically get a 10% discount. So let's, uh, let's run this again. What happens if we put a letter in where we should put a number in? So if we run this again, and let's just say type C, and then we put in a letter here, well, we get an error here, right? So this is something we never want in application de development. We talk about uh, graceful failures in application development and th this ex this is an example of, of not of something that's not a graceful failure we've got a pretty ugly error here even for a, a pro programmer we may not know you know it may be confusing and it's certainly going to be confusing for an end user not only that but from a security standpoint if you look at what's happening here I mean we've got I mean we've got some Java classes and utilities and methods that we're revealing to the end 
user. Um, we've got actually a line number here, Java, uh, and then line. That's this tells us that the error occurred on line 17. So this was the input for the next double. Of course, we were expecting a double, and we, we got a string. Um, so not only is it ugly to the user and a very ungraceful way to fail, uh, it, there's it's also kind of a security hole, right? Because users are, are sort of, you know, getting a look into the back end of the program and what's going on there. Okay, so let's look at uh, the program or the exercise we're going to look at is going to be exercise 5.1 and 5.1 uh, asks you to do a couple of things there. You've got a catch try statement that I think you're going to put put in place um, and then uh, but I think we're going to focus on number four of uh, exercise 5.1 so let's just read through that and then we're going to uh, I'm going to we're going to implement some code inside the pro program here. So number four says create a static method. So we're getting back to this idea. We introduce static methods in uh, chapter four. And um, so we're going to kind of continue with this idea of a static method. So uh, code a static method named get valid customer type uh, that does the validation of step three. And then step three, of course, asks us to, I'm reading here, first sentence there on step three, modify the application so that it only accepts customer codes R and C. Someone else asked a question about this, and really we're talking about uppercase and lowercase R and, and C. We're using the, uh, uh, we're get, using the ignores, uh, ignore case. Uh, let's see, we're using equals ignore case here. So just assume when you see that, that it, this is, we're talking about upper and lower case. So it'll accept, uh, it'll accept only upper and lower case R and C. Anything else, whether it's a, a number or a letter, uh, the user will get an error message back and they'll get a chance to input a, um, input, um, input a valid string. So rather than me kind of hack through some code, I've got someone else asked this. I've off 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 screen. I've already got some code, and it's just much quicker and it's less painful for you uh, for me to just paste code in, in than it is uh, for you to to watch me try and run through code. So a couple of things we're going to do first. Let's just I'm just going to go ahead and paste in the static method that I'm going to use, and then we'll actually implement it inside the program. So. Again, our methods are going to go outside, just outside of our main method. So that's going to go here. So I'm going to paste that in. So let's just sort of walk through what we've got here. So this is going to be, so first off, this method is called get valid customer type. And then we notice number four also asks us, uh, and I'm reading from the second sentence on number four, it says this method should include one parameter that receives a scanner object, and it should return a valid customer uh, type code. And so that's what we see here. First off is uh, the, uh, the method name is get valid customer type. And then you can see we're also passing the scanner object to this method. And then the return type is down here at the bottom of returning customer type. And of course, we've defined that here um, in um, line 62. Okay. Um, again, this is a private method. That just means that only this class can use it. That'll make more sense when we get into multiple classes. And then also we're using string here. String is the return type. And that just means that this return type at the bottom has to be the same. And so kind of what does that mean? If I try to do int here, let's see, notice the error that I get here. If I hover over this, notice it says incompatible types uh, re required int found string. Okay, so I'm trying to return a string when the method says I should be returning um, and int. Okay, so just kind of be aware of that. So we'll change that back to string. Okay, so all that looks looks good. You can see um, there's not any errors. We'll, we'll come back and kind of walk through this code a little bit more. Um, but let's let's come up here and actually implement it. Now notice if I run the program now, it it should should still run because I haven't changed any of the logic up in the main method to actually use that static method yet. And in fact, when I run it, um, in fact, let's put in a, a something other than R and C. If I put in F, for instance, you know, it's still going to run um, because we haven't implemented this static method yet. So how do we actually implement it up top here? So a couple of things we need to do. Um, so where we get the input type for customer type, we notice it is here in line 14 and 15. So we can leave the output message because we, we're still asking the user to enter a customer type. But here when we do this next double, this is where we want to actually call this 
uh, this this uh, get valid customer type. So I'm just going to comment that out, and then I'm going to come down here and I'm going to paste this in. So what do we got here? So our our variable is still a string, just like it was up in in line 15 here. So it's still a string. We're, we're still calling it customer type. And that way, this customer type variable is still valid for the rest of this code here. Uh, but notice, rather than use this scanner object, the next method on the scanner object, we're calling this get valid customer type. And then we're passing, um, we're passing the scanner object down to our method. Okay, And let's just run this and see if it works. Okay, so first off, I see a kind of an issue here. I've got two inner customer types, so that's kind of a problem. But let's just go ahead and enter it and see what see what we get. So I'm going to enter some valid data in first. So I put R in. That looks okay. And I'm going to do 400, and that, that actually looks good, right? It ran. I mean, there's still, like I say, there's still some issues here with the inner customer type displaying twice. Let's hit yes again. And then, in fact, we see that again, so we'll have to go back and debug that. Let's put in something other than R. So I'm going to put in G, and let's see. Wow, so that worked, right? Isn't that nice? So now if we put in, so you see invalid customer type, try again. So I'm going to put in capital G. Nope, doesn't like that. Capital E, lowercase e, all that's good. So I'm going to put in R, and it works. All right, so I'm going to say no here. Okay, so first let's debug our issue with uh, the, with uh, inner customer type printing twice. So if I just go back and look anywhere where I, I, you notice I have inner customer type uh, at the top here, but then if I scroll down to my get uh, get valid customer type method, I've also got customer type here. So all all that's happening is this is displaying twice. I could really display it in either place. Um, it probably makes more sense to display it down in the uh, in the static method. So I'm going to come here and comment this out because again, that again, this idea of modularizing our, our code. I mean, that inner customer type really should live in the get valid customer type um, method. Let's take a minute or two and just walk through this code so we're kind of clear here. So when we call the get valid customer type method, we, we're passing our scanner object down and this the scanner out object or scanner class is just a way for us to get input from the console from a terminal window uh, we're creating this string uh, variable uh, called customer type and we're just setting it to an em empty string we just sort of need a placeholder before the user actually enters you know RC or whatever their customer type is we, we need a uh, uh, we need a valid variable to actually store um, that user input uh, this is valid is this is just called a flag generally we'll, we'll call this a flag in program this is just a general co programming concept you'll see it in all languages but generally you need some kind of place holder and it's just going to be a boolean value so that means it's true false or zero or one and it's just sort of a place holder for any given value in this case it's a placeholder for telling us whether the user has inputted valid data or or not so what that allows us to do is we can did then do this while loop to says okay while is valid is false so um, the initial value of is valid is set to false and then we say while is valid is false and then we run through this this loop um, we only hit this is valid is true if the user enters uh, either or or C and so that's what this first if statement does it says um, it, and then here's our here's our here's our next method that we used same as we did up in the main method but then we have this if statement that says so remember our not operator the exclamation point is our not operator so this basically says if customer type dot equals in our case is not R and then it's also not C then we're going to print this invalid customer type okay and we're going to keep doing that until this is true in which case we'll fall down here and we'll set is valid to true we'll get the user input with the next line and then we're going to return whatever the user in inputted and again we're calling that up uh, up in our main method here okay all right so i think that's all we're going to cover there um, again warm up to this idea of external methods i think we got time let me do one more I, let me i'm gonna go offline for a second and set up one more um just example of a static method just so we're okay with that okay so i went offline and just coded up just wanted to like 
break this down to its bare bones, the this idea of a static m method or a, a, a private or, or static method. Notice I created one, I created a method here called marks method. So a couple things. It's private again. And really this could be, I think, let's try it real quick. This could be public or private and it would work the same way. So see public will work the same way. Public just means, again, this won't doesn't make sense now, but it will in a few weeks, that uh, public means that other classes outside of this uh, this particular class could use this method. Um, so again, public or private just means whether other classes can use it. Now notice this time I've used, um, I don't think you may not have used this yet, but this, this one's void. So void just means there's no return statement. I'm not returning anything back when I call this method. Uh, and then the name of it, I just called it marks method. There are no arguments. Notice that I've left this blank because I'm not passing any arguments to it. You'll see that when I call the method. And then all I'm doing is I've got a, a print statement that said, hey, I made it to Mark's method. Now, let's. how do we call this? So let's go up here in our code, and I'm just going to call it from right here. When you call methods, if it's internal, if it's not associated with a class outside of your the main method you're in, you can just call it by the method's name. In this case, we call it Mark's method, and then I always need to end um, method calls with the double double parentheses and then always close with a semicolon. Um, now what do we think, take take a second here and think to yourself, okay what do we think um, is going to happen here? Alright, so I put this at the end of the print line after the continue statement, so our program should run as normal, and let's see it run. So I'm going to enter R and then I'm going to enter some numbers and then, so if I say no then at this point Mark's method is going to get called. And just think for a second what's going to ha happen here. Let me scroll down so you can see it. So this method is going to be called. What do you think is going to happen? Okay, so now I'm going to say yes and let's see. So basically what happened is I, I made it to Mark's, made it just printed out this print line statement. It just called that print line statement. And since I said yes, I want to continue, it just started, I just started back at the top of the main method. So it's going to take input again. My user validation should still work. Yep, invalid customer type. Invalid customer type. Number, I get the same thing. So I can enter an R, that works. And enter a number and then I say no again this method I'm this marks method gets called again so again just think of a I, I like to think that you know there's all different kind of ways to think about this stuff and you have to use what works for you I like to think of a, a method as um, as uh, and they're also you might have heard them essentially a function is the same thing as a method too you'll also you hear the term function used functions used in other languages but it's just a way to modularize code and kind of pull it outside of your main method okay so i think that's all we've got for this week good luck